everybody. Happy Sunday to you. I'm going to invite you to stand up as we get ready for worship here and just greet, say hello to somebody around you, say good morning, share a hug, share some love. prepare our hearts for worship this morning. I'm just going to invite you to close your eyes and bow your heads and just come before the Lord. What is it that you need to bring to him this morning? God is our father in heaven. He cares about you. He cares about everything going on in your world. Just allow yourself a moment to come to your heavenly father. This morning, God cares for you, and he wants to remind you of his care this morning. God knows everything that you're going through. God knows everything that you're facing, and he wants to pull you in close this morning. And God is able this morning. God not only cares and knows, but God is all-powerful. God can move on your behalf and act on your behalf. So I invite you this morning to present your request to the Lord and ask for his help in your life. And I invite you to lift up those that you know need God's help this morning and bring, bring them before the Lord and ask him to move on their behalf. God, we need you today. And we do ask humbly, Lord, for your help and your strength. And we ask you to move in our lives and in the lives of those around us. We're going to move in our time of worship. We're starting with, with a song called Cornerstone. Jesus is our cornerstone.
Sense that says that you incline your ear to hear us. You bend your ear to listen. Take this quiet moment right now and just connect with your heavenly Father. We love you, Lord. We place all of our needs in your hands this morning. Your word says, do not worry. God sees when a sparrow falls to the ground. He knows the number of hairs on our head. We don't need to worry with you as our Heavenly Father, with you as our shepherd. We have all that we need. Thank you, Lord. We trust in you today. Let's pray together the prayer appointed for today. Almighty God, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Yeah. Let's uh, actually stay standing just for one more minute. Um, as many of you have heard already, and you saw the banner as you came in, uh, the Moon community lost a young man named Luke Cooper uh, last week. Luke was a student at Moon High School, and uh, Saint Phil he's part of our St. Philip's youth group here. Uh, the viewing is going to be here Monday and Tuesday, the funeral on Wednesday. Corey's been doing an amazing job coordinating with the family. Last night we had a share and prayer service here. So as a church community, we want to pray for Luke's family and the Moon community this morning. Let's pray. Uh, God, we thank you for the life of Luke Cooper. We grieve with his family and his friends for his loss. We thank you for uh, the life that you gave and pray, God, that... Um, in this time, that St. Philip's Church would be able to be a place of peace and of grace for this community. Pray for his friends as they grieve, his family as they grieve, and that we as a church could bless this community and hold out your resurrection hope and life as we have already done this weekend and will continue to do this week. We ask your blessing in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated for the announcements. Thank you, Steve. Um, and thank you to Corey as well for all of his work that he's done for all of the services. It, last night was a real um, just blessing. As some of you that were here know, it was just a completely packed house here. And it, it's just really cool to see our church coming together. So thank you to everybody who's been helping with this. Um, I've got just a few announcements to fill you in on what's going on around here. And then we'll have our reading. Um, Easter services are coming up here pretty quickly. We've got a Maundy Thursday service at 7 p.m., um, and then a Good Friday noon service. And then Easter is actually our same normal worship times here. So um, we've got the 7.30 a.m. still. That's our kind of quiet, contemplative service, and then the 9 and 11 on Easter. Today, Corey is having a meeting for the missions trip. So that's going to be after this service in the Henning House, Anybody that's even remotely interested, like if you just want to hear more about it, it's not, you're not signing up for anything today, but he's taking a group of people to go serve um, those in poverty down in the Dominican Republic, and it's just going to be a week of, of service, and if you're at all interested, feel free to stay for that meeting over at the Henning House. It's going to be July 5th through the 12th. Anybody's welcome. Um, women's retreat is coming up the weekend of May 19th. 
So those of you women in here, just keep that in your minds. You can start to register online if you're interested in that. On April 15th, Saturday night, um, I'm part of a new kind of worship band, and I'm really excited about it, and I'm bringing, it's, it's actually a bunch of worship leaders from all over the country, and I'm bringing them in for the weekend, and we're doing kind of a sneak peek concert here at St. Philip's. I say sneak peek because our, our album is not released yet. It's going to be coming out soon, so you guys are going to get to hear the songs before they come out. I, it would mean so much to me to have you all there. So Saturday, April 15th, if you are in town, that's going to be 7 p.m. here. And I believe that that's it for the announcements. And now it's time for our reading. The reading for this morning is from John chapter 13, verses 1 through 17. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Jesus, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had to pull, put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that is why he said that not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example, that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know all these things, you will be blessed if you do them too. The word of the Lord. Thank you for reading. Our uh, power went out next door, so no, no printer for the uh, bulletin and a PowerPoint this morning for the sermon slides, but you'll just have to look at me the whole time. Sorry about that. So. Let's pray as we open God's word together. Father, we thank you for another Sunday to come and to worship. We thank you, God, that you are for us in Jesus. We thank you for the story of you, Lord Jesus, washing your disciples' feet and showing us how you love us to the end. We pray that we would be more like you this morning as we worship you. In Christ's name, amen. I went to a college called Wheaton College outside of Chicago. It was a Christian school, and uh, strangling myself with this thing. There we go. It's a Christian school outside Chicago, and when I was there, I was on the cross-country team, and the last couple of years I was there, I was one of the captains of the cross-country team. It was a great experience to help uh, lead the guys. And one of the things that you do as a captain of the team is to try to build community. And so since we were a Christian school, we decided that we would create small group studies amongst the guys on the team. And I remember we were uh, chatting one day after practice, and we were trying to come up with a good way to divide the guys into different groups. We were asking, you know, what nights are you free, or what dorms would you want to meet in, those kinds of things, just trying to get a sense of how to put people together well. 
And one guy, he was kind of a funny guy on the team, his name was John, he stepped forward and he's like, you know, I think I want to be in a group and I only have two conditions for being in this group. Number one, you put me with people who have no problems and number two, who will expect nothing of me. <laughs> and on those conditions, I'll join any group that you want. John was making a joke, of course, but it uh, it was a funny moment because whenever you think about plunging into Christian community, into a group of friends, into a Bible study, you think, that sounds great in theory, great on paper. I would love to get to know some other Christians and be with them, provided that there are absolutely no downsides for me in this bargain, right? There's a sense in which, can we have this rich friendship, but is there a way just to make sure that it's never inconvenient always satisfying, and I will get more out of it than I have to put into it. That's the human response of wanting to be a bit guarded when it comes to community. And yet, what we see in this passage from John chapter 13 is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, showing us a different and better way. It's a way in which he shows that the path to true life and true joy and true peace is in giving yourself away as a servant, even though and especially because he is the infinite God, he shows how glorious and good he is to give himself away in servanthood as he washes the disciples' feet. So this morning I want to walk through the story in a few parts and show that servanthood is at the heart of God, and if it's at our hearts as well, it will bring us his life and peace. So three points this morning. First is that <clears throat> servanthood shows us the glory of God, the very character of who he is, Secondly, that servanthood is how we come to God. It's the condition for us. We have to be served by God to come to him. And then third and finally, that servanthood, not equality, is what orders the kingdom of God. And so I'll repeat those as we go through. Uh, but let's start first with servanthood shows us the glory of God. Here's how the story begins in verse 1. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew now that the time had come for him to leave the world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Other translations say he loved them to the end. Last shot on earth, last meal with them, the final supper, the night before he's arrested, he loves them to the end. The evening meal was already being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew the Father had put all things under his power, that he had come from God and was returning to God. Jesus knows in this moment that in the next 24 hours he's going to die for the sins of the world and fulfill the great cosmic plan of God and set straight all of human history. And with this knowledge in mind, what does he do? He gets up from the meal, takes, out his out, uh, takes off his outer clothing, wraps a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water in a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. If you knew you were in the last 24 hours of your life, how would you spend that time? The things that jump to my mind, at least at first, are I would like to be served by the people in my life. I'd like to have my favorite meal. I'd like somebody to take me to my favorite place. I think I would also like to serve others. I'd like to make a whole bunch of phone calls. I'd like to say goodbye to people as well. But it would be a mix for me of being served and serving others. How does Jesus respond in the last 24 hours of his life? As the infinite God, he decides that he's going to love his disciples to the end by loving them in this amazingly humble act of washing their feet. In the ancient Near East, of course, uh, feet were gross. Uh, they're gross in all ages and cultures, but especially gross in this culture. People wore sandals. They walked on dusty roads. They had to travel by foot basically everywhere they went, unless you were rich and and your feet were touching a horse or a donkey. But the point is that this was one of the lowest jobs that a slave could do. These were among the lowliest tasks within a domestic environment. And Jesus gets down and one by one washes the feet of his disciples, knowing that within hours, 11 of them are going to desert him and one is going to betray him. When he does this, Jesus is showing us not his weakness, but his greatness. 
He's showing us that in the very heart of God, humility and servanthood and pouring your life out for others is the mark of his greatness. It is why he is such an amazing God to worship. He is a God who simultaneously can fling the Milky Way into existence and hold the galaxies in his hand, and he can also become a Jewish peasant, work as a construction worker, a carpenter, and then care and love his moronic disciples even hours before they're going to abandon him. It's not a sign of his lowness. It's not a sign of his weakness. It's a sign of his greatness that he can stoop this low in an act of love. And notice as well that this is an act of grace that is extended to friend and foe. Eleven of the disciples will abandon him, but then come back and be restored. But one of them, Judas Iscariot, is going to betray Jesus. Jesus literally washes the feet of Judas, and then those feet will get up in moments later and walk out the door to go get the Roman soldiers so they can come back and arrest Jesus and torture him. And yet Jesus washes those feet as well. The point of the story here is that God is showing us the kind of God that he is, that in God's own life as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he has eternally been giving his love within himself. It's in God's very nature to love. He has enjoyed this love within triune fellowship, and when he meets human beings, his creatures, no matter how unworthy we are, what we see is a fountainhead of the love of God pouring over for those who don't deserve it. And Jesus says, I don't care. I'm putting the towel around my waist and I'm going to show you my love unto the end. Some weeks ago, I gave you my analogy of cat theology versus dog theology. It's a little soon to bring it back, but it's a good one. So I'm going to tell you one more time. Again, apologies to cat lovers out there. The difference between cat theology and dog theology, just one more time, is that a dog receives all the love and care, and a dog says to his master, You love me, you feed me, you take care of me, you must be so wonderful. Whereas cats say, you love me, you take care of me, you feed me, I must be so wonderful. (laughs) The conclusion that we ought to draw when we see Jesus, the living God, getting down on his hands and knees and washing his disciples' feet is, dear God, how wonderful and glorious you are. The conclusion is not to say that God is a pushover or that God is weak or that God is somehow like my personal assistant, or that I can fling petitions up to God and expect that he's going to meet me on my time scale, or that basically God exists to meet the emotional or felt needs of my life in this particular time. Totally wrong picture. We are not cat theologians here at St. Philip's. He made us, and he didn't have to. He saved us, and he didn't have to. And when he shows this astonishing love, the conclusion that we should draw is not, oh, I'm so important, but for some miraculous reason, the infinite God has found me important in his life. For some miraculous reason, the infinite God loves me, and I'm awestruck by it. That's the appropriate response to seeing your Savior washing his disciples' feet. It's the appropriate response to the next day, when he would go to the cross and die for you and for me, for the sins of the world. It's been inspiring over the last 48, 72 hours here at St. Philip's to see our church take on this spirit, this characteristic of God. As you heard, uh, we lost Luke Cooper on Wednesday night. He died in a car accident on I-79. He died at the scene. And it's been a moment of terrible grief for Moon High School, for his family, for his friends, for this church community. But it's also been amazing to see Corey Grant and others take the lead in ministering to the family and connecting with not only with them, but with the wider community. I've seen Corey on the phone with the Moon superintendent, with the principal of Moon Schools, with the funeral home. So many other volunteers here at St. Philip's have stepped up And I've been on various text threads with people at church. And to give you just a small sampling of the communications flying around, one couple said, we couldn't get our cleaning service this week before the funeral, which is going to be here on Wednesday. So we got a babysitter for our kids, and my wife and I are coming in to clean the church Tuesday to make sure everything is ready. Another woman runs the hospitality teams, and she says, we're going to have refreshments and greeters and people to usher people in and make sure that everyone knows where to go. 
There have been people who have been coordinating with the family, the school, the funeral home. There have been people going to Costco for water and tissues, and on and on the text messages go, and I know many of you have been involved one way or another. What happens when a community responds like this? Well, hopefully, it's showing the rest of Moon Township a little piece of the glory of God, that what binds us together as a family is not a building, not a sense of communal pride or something like that, but it's the love of God expressed in servanthood for one another. That is what is Christ-like. That is what Jesus showed the night before he died. And praise God, hallelujah, that is what our community has shown this weekend as we prepare for Luke's funeral. So that's the first thing to say about this text, that servanthood shows the glory, the very heart of God. But then it continues, and Jesus shows that it's not just who he is, but it's also how we have to come to him. We have to receive God as a servant for as strange a thought as that may be. Servanthood is how we come to God. And there's this exchange between Jesus and Peter. We pick up the story in verse 6. Jesus came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you don't realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. He said, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Well then, Lord, Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. Peter here, as he often does throughout the Gospels, is a talk first, think later strategy. Some of us can relate to that in our lives. But he's scandalized by this idea that his Lord, his best friend, he worships and admires and has devoted his life to, would take on the role of a lowly slave. It makes no sense to him. Why on earth, Jesus, would you stoop down into this position? And Jesus says, Peter, we got to do this because this is showing your connection and dependence on me. And then Peter overcorrects and he says, well, then wash everything about me. And Jesus clarifies, no, you have been washed once and now I just need to wash your feet. And in saying this, Jesus isn't speaking merely literally but also symbolically of the Christian life that there are two different types of washings that God wants to give his followers. And it's important to understand the difference between the two. The first type of washing that Jesus provides is what happens at conversion. It's the moment when you become a Christian, become a follower of Jesus, when you go from outside the family of God to inside, to use the biblical language from death to life. You are adopted into the family. And when this happens, you are, figuratively speaking, washed from head to toe. All of your sins are forgiven by God in that moment. You are clean and you are inside the family. And the only condition that scripture recognizes in which you could ever lose the love of God is if you purposefully, perpetually reject the Son of God. But on his account, for his sake, once he's got you, you're his forever. You're washed, you're inside, you belong to him. Following that, there is a second ongoing washing. And the Bible uses words like discipleship or sanctification or growth, spiritual growth for this. And this is the daily process of coming to God and being restored and refreshed in our lives. Because the fact is that while we are completely forgiven, we still sin day by day and need to come to God for restoration. Now, understanding these two types of washings is very important because without it, you will be left either insecure or presumptuous. If you don't understand, as Jesus was explaining to Peter, that the moment that you become a follower of Jesus and devote your life in surrender to him, that he forgives you entirely, well, then the rest of your life, you're going to be insecure about, perhaps I've now lost this bond with God. Maybe I've blown it too big this time. Once people found out what I've done in secret, not even God himself could rescue me from this. Perhaps I've lost the connection. And Jesus says, on my side of things, there is no problem with the purifying water of my love. 
On my side, there is no deficiency in my blood which can forgive every sin. If you have come to Christ, then you come in a secure way. You belong to him more intensely than a human father has his own child. That's how intense the binding family love, the conversion love of God is. We come from a place of security. And then Jesus explains, you still need now as a member of the family to be washed every day. It's teaching you how to live in the family because you will still stumble every day and you need daily forgiveness for your sins. And this protects against the opposite error of presumption, the idea that since I'm in and since I connected with God long ago that I can do whatever I want. And Jesus says no true son, no true daughter would act like that. Once you're part of the family, you need to keep being washed so that you can grow in my likeness. I wonder, do you think in these categories in your relationship with God? Blown it with your family, your friends, or God? Do you find yourself saying, this time I'm just beyond the pale? My sin is too great. In fact, I can't even look heavenward because I'm such a sinner. Jesus says, if I've washed you, there is no problem with my forgiveness of sins. Do you find that you have the opposite problem? That you go days, which turn into weeks, perhaps into months, without really thinking or grieving over the ongoing sin in your life, without taking it seriously, without saying, Lord, I know this is hurting you, hurting other people, hurting me, and not having a serious attitude to say, I need to be washed every day so that I can grow in Christ-likeness. The Christian attitude is to have both at the same time. Bedrock security that you belong to Christ and a zeal and a hope to keep growing in godliness for the rest of your life. Two washings, your whole body, and then day by day to be washed of sin. And so Jesus says, if you want to know me, you've got to come on these terms. You have to receive me. You have to be served by me to lay down your pride and to receive my gifts day by day. So first, servanthood shows us the very heart of God this overflowing love. Second, it's the condition for how we have to come to God. And then third and finally, what we see is that servanthood and not this idea of equality orders the kingdom. And I'll explain what I mean. Here's how the story ends in verse 12. When Jesus had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and he returned to his place. Do you all understand what I've done for you? He asked. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is who I am. And now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. And I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Jesus makes it very clear here at the end that he is greater than the disciples, obviously. He's the cosmic Lord. He created the universe. He called them all by name. He is the infinite God. He, in his grandeur, humbles himself in the most shocking way to serve them. And the lesson is that I don't care how great or small you are in the world. I don't care how small you are in the church that everybody serves everybody else within the Christian family. And we actually stop keeping track of whether they're worth it, whether they deserve it, whether it was appropriate or not, because the name of the game is everyone to serve everyone else according to the gifts that they have been given. This is a very different idea from a certain version of equality as it has come to find its root in the human mind. In his book, The Screwtape Letters, C.S. Lewis imagines how the demons tempt human beings and their strategies for sowing seeds of uh, division amongst human beings and leading us away from God's love. And in one of uh, the strategies that the demons use, one of the senior devils explains to the younger devils that you should teach men to say, quote, I'm as good as you. You should teach people, human beings, to look around them, to find people who may have more intelligence, more money, more success, more whatever, and to teach them to say, but hey, I'm as good as you are, and to teach them resentment through it, to resent the good gifts that other people have. 
and then through their resentment to create division amongst them, and then through their division, hatred amongst different people to resent the gifts that God has given. And in this way, the devil hopes to divide the church. Now, of course, there is a sense in which we are all equally loved by God. There's a political sense in which we should have equality before the law. But Jesus says in this text, I am greater than you. And by extension, some people have different gifts or are greater in one category than another. And he says, I don't want you to get hung up on who deserves what or who should be whose servant. I don't care where you think you rank in this great pecking order. That's irrelevant in my kingdom. What matters is that everyone serves everyone according to the gifts that you have. Let me share one last story to try to explain what I mean. I I started the sermon telling you about my friend John on the cross-country team. He was a funny and successful guy in college, and if you would have asked me who would have been successful after graduating, I would have said John would have been one of the guys near the top of the list, uh, given his talents, his charm, and just what an all-around likable guy he is. Shortly after college, he got married to his wife, Kaylee, And then shortly after their marriage, he got some terrible news that he was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which is a white blood cell cancer. And so they went and they got cancer treatments in the best places that you could go to. And thankfully, by God's grace, it went into remission. And then as they came up to the four-year anniversary, they found out that the cancer had come back. And so they had to go back through all the same treatments to the same hospitals, the same smells, the same experiences of waiting on blood tests. And again, it went into remission and they rejoiced. But then again, a few years later, it came back for a third time. And John and his wife Kaylee during this process, as you can imagine, had to travel to different cities for treatments. They had to suspend employment multiple times, both of them, in order to get through everything that was going on. I'm just pulling out my phone so I can read a quote to you from John. In the midst of all of this, John, who had such a promising and exciting future in front of him, had to learn to be served in a profound way. He and his wife, Kaylee, created a blog. They also had a GoFundMe. At one point, they had to raise quite a bit of money to sustain his cancer treatments. And on their blog post, they expressed at one point what the journey had been like for them. And I just want to read to you this paragraph. They said, we are trusting that God has the way marked out for us. We know that he remains faithful to us in the ups and downs, and we offer thanks that he has brought us to the cusp of receiving such innovative and promising treatment. I don't take for granted that we have had access to amazing medical institutions supported by great employers and health insurance, surrounded by an amazing community of family and friends. We are incredibly and undeservingly blessed. You continue to sustain us with your prayers, calls, texts, gifts, and acts of love and friendship. We are fortunate for each of you. Thank you for walking with us through this experience. John made a joke years ago about wanting to be in a community where people had no problems and asked nothing of him. And then he found himself in a position where he needed everyone in his life and in his Christian community to pour into him in all kinds of different ways. And his response in that moment wasn't to be ashamed or to feel lowly, but it was to be overwhelmingly grateful for the provision of God overwhelmingly grateful that he could be served by people who loved him in Jesus' name. In the kingdom, we don't keep track of who has more gifts or who has more resources or who did a better job with this. It's irrelevant, Jesus says. I don't care where you are. In your greatness, serve all those around you. In your lowness, serve all those around you. Whatever you have, serve those around you in my name. We're not infinite. There is a limit to how much we can give. I'm not counseling anyone here to stay in an abusive situation. There are limits to human giving, but if you want to understand the heart of God, the question is, Lord, this week, whom can I love in your name?
What do I have that I can give away to bless others in your name? As you do that, you discover the truth of what Jesus says. You will be so, so blessed when you give your life away as I am doing for you. Because in that you find my joy, my love, my peace forever. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you sent your son as a servant. Not because he was so low, but because he was so great. And we pray, Lord, that we also would take this lesson, serve with the same kind of love that he has, and in the process be transformed like him. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to come now to our offering. Uh, parents, you can go pick up your kids downstairs and then turn for communion. We're going to sing the doxology really quick. Would you mind standing and singing? The, as I punch myself with my friend, singing this with me. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let's sing it again. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father. Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good, Father, always and everywhere to give you thanks and praise, most especially today because you sent your Son, Jesus, as a servant to teach us servanthood as well. And so now, Father, we bring you these gifts, sanctify them by your Spirit to be the body and blood of your Son. On the night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. He said to them, take and eat, because this is my body, broken for you. Whenever you eat this meal, remember me. After supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and he said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, remember me. Father, we now celebrate this memorial of your Son. Gather us by this communion into your body and your Son, Jesus. Make us a living sacrifice of praise. By him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours. Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as Jesus has taught us, we're bold to pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance this morning that Christ died for you and be thankful. Please be seated.
start to move I speak the name cause it's all that I can do In desperation I seek heaven And pray this for you I pray for your healing The circumstances will change that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Circumstances 
pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. And I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name. stand for the blessing, and then we'll have our final song. The blessing of the God who has served you and calls you to service. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord lift up his face upon you and give you his peace now and forever. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, I just want to remind you guys about the mission trip meeting that's going to take place after the service, so feel free if you're interested at all or just want to learn more about it. That's going to be over in the Henning House. Still don't know if, if there's power over there or not, but um, I think you guys can still have a good meeting together. All right, let's sing our last song together. See my 
against the 